So please help me welcome Dr. Pablo Cabral. Hi. Thanks, Denise, for, for you know, having me here. And thanks, everybody, for showing up today. I know there is a concert going on outside. And hopefully, you know, you're going to gonna stay here for, for the next hour or so and, uh, and listen to what I, what I came to talk about. Especially, I want to call out to the kids here. And it's one thing that I love to do is to go out and talk to kids in high schools, elementary schools, and everywhere. Because I get the best questions ever from the kids. It's like they're not constrained by any knowledge or anything. They just ask the right things. So uh, it's a lot of fun for me to to these kind of outreach uh, activities. And, um, and one of the things that I wanted to clarify from the beginning is that uh, what's a planetary analog? Because probably this is something that somebody here hasn't heard before. And so when you think about uh, missions to space, you know, Mars, the moon, elsewhere, uh, it takes, takes so much effort, and not only money, but it's also time. It's, uh, it takes decades to prepare for a mission. So it's really hard to get there. And when you get there, you know, again, be it the moon or even the st space station or Mars eventually, uh, you want everything to be working perfectly. There's no second chance. You can't bring a mechanic with you. There's no IT guy to help you with everything. You need to make sure that everything's working perfectly. So uh, we're lucky enough that on Earth, uh, we have places that are very special. They're extreme in temperature, radiation, rain, desert. Uh, the conditions are really hard for life hard for us, but also hard for the machines that we're eventually going to fly elsewhere. So these places, that's what we call the planetary analogs. They're places that, uh, that serve as, an, as analogies, as similar places, as a test bed for our technology. So we go to these places over and over again, bring the machines, bring the people, even astronauts uh, that are eventually going to go to Mars, and we train, and we practice, and we break things, and we fix them, and we break it again, and so on, so on, until we're happy. And then we hand these things to NASA or to European Space Agency or other agencies, and then they can fly the stuff elsewhere. But so that's the kind of thing that I, that I do for a living. And I do this uh, at two places. Um, so I live here in St. Louis, and I came to work for WashU uh, almost 10 years ago. And I was doing research in, uh, on the main campus. And then I, uh, financial crisis came in, and we lost all the money from NASA, and, and it was a hard time for all of us. So I, I joined the SETI Institute, which is a nonprofit organization uh, based in the Bay Area in California, and we're very close to NASA. So we do a lot of contract work for them, uh, mostly in, in building technology instruments, uh, uh, building capabilities and science to eventually go to other places and learn about life. So it's all about search for life for us. Not just, uh, not just uh, ETs or the, or the aliens that you see in the movies, but we're starting slow and small. So we're, we're happy to find microbes or bacteria. So we haven't found any yet. We don't know when or if, but we're working uh, towards that goal. So that's what we do at SETI. And uh, uh, also, I work in Impossible Sensing, which is a company that I started here in St. Louis. And what I do here is all the technology that we developed for NASA, I try to find applications back to Earth. It's the clear example of you guys are giving us money at NASA and other agencies to go to the moon, go to Mars, uh, explore the universe. And through small business businesses, we're turning that technology into applications that come back to everybody. So uh, medical devices, uh, geological exploration of Earth, environmental uh, resources, things that touch everybody. So uh, it's one of the examples of the things that we do is we go to look for rocks on Mars, but we also look for rocks that are meaningful for either for mining, for environmental uh, uh, remediation. So it's things that. Everybody's connected to that. So uh, this is your tax dollars at work, usually. Uh, so, uh, so luckily, St. Louis is a good place for having a business, as most of you probably know. So I spend my time between California and here. And I'm very happy, very happy here. So, uh, so today, I'm going to give you a little tour over the world, this world, and with some connection to missions that are going to fly soon, or hopefully going to fly soon. And I'm just going to show you some of the things that we do in these places. And specifically, I'm going to focus on the tech, on the nice robots that we have. And so I have a lot of videos, pictures, and hopefully it's going to be fun for everybody. So uh, 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 this is one of the slides that NASA likes to show to portray the kind of mission that uh, they do, or we do, uh, when it comes to looking for life. And NASA has a small uh, branch that's called the Astrobiology Institute, the NAI. And basically, what we do here is what I just told you before. So we're, we're looking at, uh, at other planets and moons. Uh, we study Humble. We only look in our solar system, so things like Mars or the moons of Jupiter or Saturn. 
things that are accessible to our technology today. And what we do is we go to places here again on Earth, and this is what this map kind of uh, kind of tells you. It's like there's a lot of places and a lot of centers around the world, and we all work together, and we all uh, exchange information. We go to field sites that are again extreme, and you'll see examples of that very soon. And we're looking at things uh, not not only about life on Mars or elsewhere, but also our life on our own planet. So we don't really know how life started here. There's still a bunch of theories out there. Uh, the most trusted or the most powerful today is that life started in the bottom of the ocean, in the chimneys that are in the deep sea floor, and that, uh, that life was able to harness all the energy from the volcanoes down in the ocean. And by using the, that energy and that chemistry, they were able to start metabolism and from their life started. And so that's one of the theories that we, uh, that we are, uh, are working on right now. And we're looking for this kind of uh, early life on other planets to validate or to confirm whether this theory might be true, not only on Earth, but also elsewhere. So, uh, so that's kind of the main framework of what we're doing. So what you're going to see in the next uh, 20, 40 slides, it's examples of uh, places where we look for this life and where we develop the new technology that is hopefully eventually enable us to find this life elsewhere. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, a simplified, I guess, it's just a subset of the field sites that uh, my team and other teams, of course, we've been uh, working on in the last 23 years. Uh, not me, I'm younger than that, but, uh, but uh, I've only been in the business for 12, 15 years. And I've, I've been lucky enough to be in all these places. And uh, all of these are special in their own right. So. Uh, you probably have already identified Hawaii here as a, as, a, as a place. And it's not just because we like to party and we like to be in the beach and have fun, but it's also that as volcanoes and all these high energetic systems are very, very, very useful for life. So life likes those stuff. So this is what we try to test our technology. So it happens that Mars is, or was back in the days, a huge volcanic mayhem. So there were volcanoes all over the planet, lava running all over the place. So we are actually looking for volcanoes today, active volcanoes, to try to understand how Mars was in the past. So, uh, but, uh, so we're, uh, we're going to focus on four sites today, because we only have one hour. So, uh, so uh, we're going to go from close to the North Pole here, uh, close to the South Pole in Antarctica, and two places in the Andes. Uh, one is a desert, and one is a lake. So we have diversity from desert dry to wet lake to dry again, north and south, but in this case, this is glacier, so it's really cold, and different, ex different examples of the things that we look at uh, in these places. But of course, there is other, other analogs that we're looking at uh, in Tibet as well, Australia, uh, with some of the oldest fossils that we have found on Earth, uh, and obviously all the, all the Yellowstone and all the, all the cascades with all the volcanoes and lava tubes uh, here in the US, and places in Spain, uh, where I'm from originally. Uh, where there is certain chemistries that are really unique to life. Uh, but again, I'm going to focus on these four sites. So, uh, so uh, uh, one of the goals of going to, to these areas is that we're trying to, again, learn about Mars. So we know that Mars had oceans in the past. Mars had lakes, uh, seas, oceans. We don't know where. We know approximately when, which is two billion years ago, two to four billion years ago. Uh, Mars was a very wet planet. This is a rendering of what Mars may have looked like. Uh, uh, blue atmosphere, a uh, lot of water. And this is what it looks today. So dry and cold. So we know it was warm and wet. We know now it's dry and cold. We don't know how it happened, but we know it happened. So part of the, part of the idea of going to these places on Earth now, uh, uh, in addition to the missions we have on Mars and the ones that are going soon, is to learn what happened to Mars. And is this what's happening to Earth? Or is this what, something that we can expect for us not to happen? So we just don't really know. So we're trying to learn more about Mars, again, by going to the so-called Mars analogs. So, uh, so one of the missions that is flying soon to Mars is called, for now, it's called the Mars 2020 mission. Eventually, there'll be a call to the public to name the, the rover, like Curiosity uh, is, uh, was named. And basically, this rover is going to, if everything goes right, and I'm going to knock on boot, uh, or whatever this is. Uh, uh, so 20, 2020 is the launch date. So it should be arriving on Mars in the spring of 2021. Okay. Uh, so some of you will be in college already. So, uh, so uh, stay alert if you want to work for this. So, uh, so this rover is going gonna, gonna to be very similar to Curiosity, which is working on Mars right now. So uh, 
some of you have heard about it because I see a lot of nodding. Good. And so basically, it's a big, it's a big rover. So uh, six wheels is the size of a small, almost like a mini car, like the British minis, uh, one ton of weight. Uh, so pretty, pretty, pretty heavy machine. And it has a very powerful arm uh, that is going to be able to uh, to do several things. One of them is to analyze the rock before we do anything else to it. So before touching it, there is a laser and there is a there is a uh, uh, X-ray machine that is going to be able to scan the surface and tell us what it's made of, uh, what the rock is made of, and maybe if there is any organic or any any molecular chemistry that we can tie to life or to former life uh, on Mars. So, so once we identify something that is cool and nice looking, there is a drill somewhere here. I don't know if it's throwing, throw it, uh, so there is a small drill that is going to be able to 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 get a core, a little sample from the from the ground down to 10 centimeters probably. It's going to be able to take it out and, and store it in the rover for further analysis. And, um, and lastly, uh, it's again, if everything goes right, it's going to fly the very first helicopter on Mars, or any other planet for that matter. So, uh, so uh, it's still a prototype. We've never done it before. Uh, flying on Mars, a lot of you have flown drones here, I'm assuming, because uh, it's very, very uh, cheap today. So, but the problem on Mars is that there is no atmosphere. So well, almost no. So it's, it's a 1% of the atmosphere here. So it's almost vacuum. So to be able to fly, you need to lift. So you need to move air to push you up, right? So if there's no air, what happens? So you don't go up, right? So uh, it's like trying to, 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 to use a fan on, a, on, 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 on Mars as well. You wouldn't have any, any air coming to you. Yes, quick one. It would weigh less. It, it, weighs, it weighs a third of what it weighs here, but there's not enough mass of air that you can push around to take you up. So actually, there is. The problem is that you need to fly a, a drone that is as wide as my wingspan. This is the wingspan of the rover, of the of the flyer, two meters. That's like six feet. So, uh, so, and it only can fly a small camera, like a GoPro camera. So that's going to be the. It's going to be a cool experiment, the first demonstration of flying elsewhere. Um, but it's going to be done in this mission. So something cool, and I'll show you some stuff about that later as well. So uh, anyway, so one of the places that we that we have chosen to test uh, some of the tools that are already on Mars today and some tools that are going to fly to Mars soon is uh, this place in, uh, in Norway. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, boop, too fast. So uh, it's uh, this uh, small archipelago of islands here. And so this is uh, Norway, Greenland. Uh, we're somewhere here, I believe. No, somewhere here, actually. Uh, this is Chicago's here, so uh, right here. So, um, so uh, this is like about 500 miles from the North Pole, so it's somewhere here. And so uh, what happens here is that think about Hawaii again, but now think about Hawaii, but super cold <laughs> and dark. So uh, so this is what Svalbard is all about. It's a volcanic archipelago. So volcanoes came up through a lot of lava, and lava slowed, uh, slowly poured over, cooled down, and formed uh, the terrain that we see there today. So. Um, so forget about these maps on the left. This is all geological uh, information. If somebody of you is a geologist, uh, feel free to pick it. But I, I just wanted to, to bring you, your attention to the pictures here. Because uh, uh, one of the things that we see on Mars is a lot of red stuff and orange. And that's a lot of iron. And it's all oxidized. So uh, here being volcanic uh, activity, and all you see here is all, all volcanoes. They're all now flat, but they were pointy and volcanic back in the days. So uh, what we have now is a lot of uh, places that are look exactly the same as Mars. If you forget about the water <laughs> for a minute, uh, this is what a place is that Mars looks exactly like this. In topology, so you see all these uh, all these uh, little galleys here and all the formations, but also in geochemistry, minerals. So it's the same stuff basically. So here we can actually understand volcanic processes and how these processes uh, alter the minerals in a cold environment. So the alteration that you see in Hawaii with all the forests and all the jungle and all the uh, all the soil, you don't see it here. Because here it's been way colder than in Hawaii and way drier. So you see different rocks here, even if it's the same magma that came up from the, from the center of the Earth. So uh, some examples of volcanoes as well, and some of the chimneys uh, that were associated with those volcanoes as well. So there were fluid coming from here, uh, not lava, but hot water, like think about Yellowstone. So this is the kind of geysers that you have over there as well. Um, uh, uh, because there is magmatic and there is hydrothermal activity there, there is uh, hot springs. And this go year round. So it could be minus 20 Fahrenheit in the winter or lower, but you still have like balmy, probably 60, 65 degrees water coming out of the, seeping out of the, of the ground because it's so hot down below. So it's still 
comes out of the surface as liquid. So uh, you have very nice uh, hot springs over there. And, um, and again, if you remember what I said earlier on, like uh, hot springs or volcanoes, chimneys, this is the place where we think life started here. So it's a good place for us to look for life elsewhere, right? So this is a good place for us to understand how bi biology, how the bacteria and microbes interact with the environment and make specific minerals and chemistries that we can tie to, to specific forms of life. So, uh, so some more stuff about uh, some of the, of the Mars gullies. Gullies are like little, I guess, troughs or little tunnels that come down of the, from, the, from the mountains. And, and we have the same formations on Mars as well. So, um, so and again, lava deltas and all kinds of volcanic stuff that you can imagine. We have it here, and it's cold, always. So it's a very good place to preserve stuff. Uh, nothing degrades there. Uh, um, so the way we go around these places is that, uh, so we, this is the, the main town here in Svalbard. It's called Long European, and it's about 2,000 people for a whole island where there is about 5,000 polar bears. Okay, so, uh, so we're, we're minority, but nevertheless, so what we do is we, we, we hire an RV, a research vessel, with science labs and stuff, and a nice crew, and we just drive around uh, the island, and we find specific places to do our science, and when we find a place, we just get Zodiacs, and just get off to shore, and of course, with a rifle and, and coffee to stay warm, but uh, so our tools there is science instruments, uh, which you will see here, uh, some of the things that we do, and uh, of course rifles to make sure that there's no accidents with bears, although we've never had an accident, and coffee to stay warm. So, uh, so some of the things we do here is we test rovers as well. So we, we bring the rovers that we want to send elsewhere, and we play with them. Uh, we have cameras and drills and everything there. We have lasers, and laser is one of my, the techniques that I use most. And we just shoot lasers at things, and we see the reflection, like when you see here. So we read that light that comes back, and we can tell things about the rocks or the ice, or the bacteria, so we can tell what things are made of by shooting laser. And here we're just you know playing with things and some more uh, tools, ice analysis, uh, more rover stuff. Here we have a remote sensor. So with this machine, we can shoot uh, lasers up to 100 meters away and get information about things as they come. So for example, this is an example of uh, analysis of a, of a red algae on a glacier. So we have a glacier here. And what we set up, we set up our instrument, in this case, is just 10 meters away. And I was trying not to shoot. Uh, this, this was my boss back in the days, my, my supervisor. So I was trying to, like, do I like him today or not? So, uh, let's, uh, so uh, but uh, no, we're friends. But, uh, but so basically what we did is just to, to see if we could detect uh, life here, which we knew it was there because it's an algae. But we're trying to see the signals with our instrument. So this is, a, again, a tech demo for us to learn how to work with our instrument in a super cold environment and looking for things that are uh, usually hidden within the ice. So we're able to see things close up. And you see the green spot here? That's the laser. Uh, so that's, with that laser, we're able to shoot and get this, this profile here, this data point. And then we can tell what these things are made of. And uh, the same we did with, to do more tests. Um, uh, we, this is the, in, in the boat, as you can see. And we have the system set up somewhere on the left here. And you'll see it in a minute. And we're trying to do like, was the maximum distance we can go with this instrument, because it's the first time this came to the field. So, uh, so we're able to do in the boat about 15 meters. Uh, uh, that's like 50 feet, I guess. But uh, although I don't, have, uh, I don't have videos here of this, but we were able to shoot one of the icebergs that, that you see here on the, on the background uh, up to 120 meters. So that's our maximum range. Uh, and this is 10 years ago. So you know, things have been made better these days, but this was the first demonstration of a remote sensor that you can shoot lasers at things and get data to you in terms of chemistry and minerals. So a uh, pretty, pretty cool experiment. And sometimes we went out to, the, to some of the ice floats. And here, note the rifle. That's the tool. And, and these things float. So sometimes you just get to work and get lost, and you have to hitchhike your way to the, to the boat. Uh, uh, and hopefully, there's some sailor with, uh, with a Zodiac to take you back. But um, so that's the kind of thing that we do in the ice. Okay. So now, moving completely different place, we're going to a desert. So, uh, so we're going to Aracama, Chile, here. And this is, so the equator is somewhere here. Okay, so this is like a very tropical area or warm area. And, uh, and the Andes run all the way through here. So you see all this green stuff on the right. So this is, this is downhill, downslope into the ocean. So it's all wet and, and rainy from the, from the Atlantic. But over here is all dry because there is this, uh, the Andes, the volcanoes that are right there, 
are blocking all the wet moisture from the ocean, so it creates a hyper arid environment. So Atacama has been for 25, 30 years, it's been the, the main playground for NASA and other agencies to test the rovers and the Mars missions, because A, it's super dry, it's probably the driest place on Earth, uh, it just never rains, literally, never. Sometimes there is a little moisture coming in when it's super cold, but it just doesn't rain. So super dry. It's at high elevation. Uh, we're doing measurements and doing science there at about anywhere from 12,000 to 18,000 feet above sea level, so super high, and which means that there is a lot of UV radiation coming down to you. So if you think that a July, August day in St. Louis here, sunny, burns your skin, multiply that by 10, and that's the kind of feeling you have in, when you're up there. So it really fries stuff. And when I say stuff, I mean you, but also any, any life that could develop there. So the result is that this is one of the places where on Earth where there is less amount of life, okay? There's life everywhere on Earth. Whatever you can imagine, there's life. Maybe no animals or plants, but there is microbes or bacteria. Even in Arakama, but there is so little that this is the best case scenario for a potential search for life on Mars. So Mars, if there's any life, or there was any life in the past, it's going to be very little. It's going to be this spread around. So we're going to have to be very careful on how to find it. So we choose this place because it's the best case scenario. Well, it's, the, it's the best case scenario for us as, of, as in terms of being able to find things there. So um, as you will see, the things you see there are pretty, pretty amazing. And, uh, and uh, uh, so th this is one of the few areas where actually some moisture comes in in front of ice. It just precipitates, it just rains ice or snow, and it stays there for, for a while. But uh, you see like all former lakes and, and lagoons that are dry out, and it's just salt formations with clay. Just clay, salt, sulfates, just very, very, very desert. Uh, plus it's in high elevation, so it's hard to breathe, a lot of sand, it's dusty, so it's a pretty harsh place to work, but it's, that's exactly what Mars is all about. So this is a place where we not only we test the limits for the robots, but also for humans to be able to do work over there, but, but it's fun. And sometimes you have like active volcanoes as well. So the Andes is one of the most active volcanic areas on, on Earth, and sometimes we have to call off uh, expeditions, just because when you see yellow smoke coming from here, that's sulfur, and that's bad stuff for you, so we have to run away. And, but uh, for the most part, it's, uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is the kind of places, in each one of these places, we've deployed some of the technology, and either be drones, or rovers, or some of the handheld instruments that uh, you will see uh, right now. So, um, so uh, one thing that we do here that we don't do up in Svalbard is connected to another Mars mission that is going to fly to Mars on 2020, which is the European Space Agency rover. Uh, again, so it's going to be launching at the same time as the American one. So it's going to be kind of like a race, see who, who's getting there first. Uh, but uh, so, so this this rover is part of of the Extra Mars mission which already launched an orbiter in 2016. So this guy is already on Mars and is flying around and getting data about the atmosphere and is helping us select what exactly we want to land with the rover in 2021. Uh, so the important thing about this rover is that unlike the one from NASA or any other rover ever, for that matter, it has, it has, a, it has a, a very deep drill, very deep as in two meters, six feet. So right now, the deepest we've been able to dig or to drill on Mars is about five to 10 centimeters. That's like, what, like four inches uh, max. And uh, with this guy, we're gonna be able to go down to two meters. And this is important because uh, Mars not only is dry and cold, but it also has no magnetic field, no atmosphere. So anything that is shooting into Mars, gamma rays, uh, cosmic radiation, is hitting the surface nonstop. Here on Earth, we are shielded from all that, for the most part, because of our atmosphere and magnetic field, but Mars doesn't have that luxury. So everything is shooting on Mars. So the result is that any, any organic, any chemical, or anything that resembles to life, that is gone on the surface. There's almost none of it anywhere because it's so exposed to that kind of nasty radiation. So uh, what you have to do to find life, if there's any, is to, is to uh, to dig down below. So uh, this, uh, if you dig down after one meter, one and a half meters, we believe that the rock protects protects ah, protects the the life that might be there I enough to make to allow it to survive. Uh, so again, surface nasty, harsh. If you go down, it's a little bit better for life. There is more humidity. Uh, there could be pockets of water or ice down there, 
And we know there are actually, uh, we just don't know where, but there must be. And the idea is to go down, down again six feet and be able to bring sample back up and use the, the insights of the rover with very, very powerful tools to be able to understand what this two meters environment is made of in terms of chemicals, minerals, and life, if any, uh, or former life, if any. So, uh, so for that, we, we brought down to the Atacama. We brought a rover that is, doesn't look like anything like space rover, because you know, it has bicycle wheels and everything, but, uh, but it does the job, right? So the goal here is to drive and to use our drill uh, to drill down the two meters to get samples and to analyze them with instruments that we uh, hear they're, they're exposed on the surface. And some of you probably know, know the WashU logo here. So this was a WashU. Well, WashU is part of the big team uh, that did these experiments. And this is my, by the time I was working at WashU uh, back in the days. And, um, and so, uh, so we have very, very cool tools down there in, in campus. But uh, so, so the things that we do, yeah, again, it's like get the drill. And I don't know if you can see it very well here, but, uh, but the drill is a different positions here and we have an auger so you think about when you drill a hole in your wall there's powder coming out so we want that powder so so we have a system that is able to suck all that powder coming up the, the drill bits we call it or tailings and we're able to funnel them into little uh, sample holders these little capsules little cups if you want and then we pass this uh, powder into the instruments that are inside here or outside so this is how we practice for the potential, uh, or not potential, it's happening now. Uh, there is funding for that, so it was happening for the ExoMars mission. It's the same system. It's, a sample is going to come up. Instruments are going to analyze this, uh, this thing. So we, we test these things in, in the Atacama, but we also test uh, for new instruments that uh, that we're hoping to fly in future missions, like uh, some more laser stuff that we're doing here, uh, some more drilling, uh, deep drilling. But we're, instead of getting instead of getting the drill bits and the tailings, we actually get the whole core. So we get a full cylinder of rock, much like the Mars 2020 NASA mission is going to do. And sometimes this rock is good to have it in, in its form instead of powder, because sometimes you see structure here, right? So you see different colors that can tell you things about, about what is, the thing is made of. And in this case, these are bacteria that are living there. So if you have this thing coming out intact, as opposed to powder, as here, then you have a better chance to detect things uh, on a mission. And, and yeah, so we test all these things in, in many, many, many different environments uh, over there. And mm -hmm. sometimes when it's too harsh to be outside, we have our science truck uh, here. <laughs> and so when it's too, too nasty, we just, we just bring the stuff in, right? So we have some of the instruments that can work in both places uh, outside or inside. And for example, this is a, a commercial uh, version of the X-ray diffraction machine that is working on Mars as we speak. So, uh, so Curiosity has an X-ray machine. And the guys that build it, um, and NASA Ames, they developed a commercial unit for this. And they've been using this in environmental, for the USGS and the EPA have been using this for their own research as well. So clear example of how space tech, NASA investment, comes back as another tool for their agencies or other people to, to do some other work. Um, and the vehicles that we use, of course, pickup trucks. And so we have met stations as well to control for environmental uh, systems. And sometimes there is water and rivers and stuff. So there is chemists getting samples and getting all the all the information so so again it's a very diverse and rich environment and uh and it's you know we try to go for a month every year but in a month it's not even enough time to even scratch the surface of the good things that we can understand there so uh luckily enough nasa has been very good at giving us uh resources to not just my team but a lot of different teams to do multiple things in the Atacama. so we're slowly understanding the whole ecosystem much better than we did before and we're getting closer to know how we can tie what we see here to what we see on Mars today, or we hopefully to see on Mars in the future with the new missions. So, um, so I told you about this helicopter, so I didn't forget about it. Uh, so, uh, so again, this guy on 2020 is going to be able only to fly and take pictures. Uh, but in my team, we're working on a new system uh, called ASTAR, and this is it's able not only to do that but also to take samples. So we have a commercial drone. We modify it, and we have a scoop here. So we're able to, to fly this guy. Uh, this is the Andes, again, about 15,000 feet. And with this guy, we can take pictures. And it's all automated, so all, all smart drone uh, with computers. And it's able to do all kinds of mapping uh, to tell you what the, map, what the terrain is made of, uh, so either sulfates or carbonates or whatever you want it to, to tell you. It's able to find a landing spot that is safe for it to, to go down, so it can by itself, just 
slowly, slowly go down, correct, if there is any roughness. And this is the important part. This is the sampling side. So, so getting sample back to you, as opposed to having to drive or to walk, uh, is something very important, uh, not just for, for the next missions to Mars, where we want to bring uh, uh, samples back to, to perhaps the lab or to humans. But also think about places on Earth where, where you have you know, nuclear disaster or a chemical spill or oil spill, things that you don't want humans to be around. So having the capability to, to fly a machine to the place that you want and get a sample without being exposed to the nastiness of things is something that is very useful for, for us as well here on Earth. So, uh, so we're working on, on, on making this system even smarter, being able to work with multiple other drones. So we have like an army, if you want, of drones just doing analysis for you. So you can save time, resources, and eventually for us, for astronauts, it will be way safer to be able to fly than just to walk or to drive, which, uh, which I didn't tell you earlier, but one of these rovers that we're gonna send to Mars, from going from where I am to the end of the, of the room, which is what, like 15, 15 meters, maybe like 30 feet, it may take a day, day and a half, just to go from here to there. Why? Well, it's because we're very conservative and we're very careful and we don't want to crush it or to break it. So Mars is not flat and nice like here. So it's all made of little rocks and little boulders and you want to avoid them. So the rover has smart computers that can navigate around, but sometimes they're not smart enough. So they stop, stop down, stop, and they call back home for instructions and, hey, help me, I don't know what to do. So a human has to basically joystick it and has to prepare a new route to be able to get there. So it's a very painful and slow process. And obviously with a drone, you can do that like many, many times faster. So uh, that's one of the things that we're working on. And so, so that's some of the examples of the Mars research that we do. Uh, but uh, there's way more to looking for life or to exploring space than Mars. Mars is easy because it's easy. Well, well, uh, it's nearby. It only takes six months to get there. Uh, with a good rocket, and we, we have a 50-50 chance to land safely there. The track record is 50% success, so you know, it's a good bet that you can fly something there and it's going to work. Uh, now, when it comes to other places like, uh, like the moons of uh, Jupiter or Saturn, that's more complicated. So, A, uh, it takes five years to get there. So it's like, fly, you shoot it, and then you wait for five years. But during that trajectory, tra that, that, trans that transportation uh, time, there is a lot of radiation that is coming to you, not just from the, from the sun and from the general cosmic background, but also from Jupiter and Saturn themselves. They have uh, uh, magnetic radiation that is gonna, it's gonna basically destroy and fry your electronics. Uh, so uh, we had some missions that have been able to, to fly by and to pass through uh, nearby Saturn and like Cassini, uh, for example, and, but they don't last very long because it's really, really harsh environment. So we don't have the technology yet to do a very good investigation of these planets, although we're working on it. So we'll get there. But uh, uh, some of the places that we're looking at that are very, very promising for us in terms of uh, places that are safe to, to fly or to send a mission, but also places that are rich enough in science that is worth the investment, right? So Thailand, for example, is, is an example. is is the only planet or moon uh, in our solar system that has an atmosphere that is thick enough for us. And not only that, it's actually it's thicker than our atmosphere. It's 50% it's thicker. So if flying on Mars is a problem, flying here is even easier because you have way more air. So you can fly more, more stuff. And I will show you an example of that. So, uh, but, so we know that, that, that uh, not only it has an atmosphere, uh, although it's very cold, uh, but it has uh, multiple layers of things happening here. And because of the thick atmosphere and the high pressure, Titan is again the only planet that has liquid on the surface. So there is oceans and seas right there. It's not water, unfortunately. It's, it's basically oil. It's methane, ethane, it's hydrocarbons, things you could run a motor with, uh, but it's liquid. So you could technically sail and you could actually dive and you could actually have a submarine over there fairly easily. And so uh, that's one of the missions that NASA proposed or, or one of the missions that NASA studied and invested some, time, some, some money into it and to develop the technology to, hey, let's go there, maybe. It never flew, unfortunately, but, um, but the, the idea was to, to send a couple of, uh, of uh, yeah, of this, I say floats or, I don't know, or, or barges, or I don't know how you call it, but uh, we call it lake lander, because uh, you, la you land in a lake and then you just sail the seas of Tehran. So uh, personally, I. I thought it was worth doing it just for the fun of it, because you know, 
we all like the water and sail and me outside, you know, so just f sending something to Mars to drive, that's fun and we can do it. But sailing in other planets, that's just super cool. But, uh, but not only, not, the cool factor is there, but also these lakes, uh, oceans being hydrocarbons, uh, they may have uh, organic molecules that are life-like or life-friendly. Because uh, we know there is, uh, there must be water as well on Titan because of meteor meteorites impacting. So there's water, uh, there's atmosphere, there could be chemicals that are precursors to life. So it's a good place for life uh, research. So that's why now, uh, as of I think it was six months ago or something like that, NASA announced that it's going to fund uh, the phase A. So that's the concept study for the Dragonfly mission. Uh, which is a mission that is going to have a drone. This is a proper drone. It's a quadcopter, although here it's six, but it's, it's going to be four. Uh, and the idea is that uh, because, again, because the atmosphere is so thick, you can easily fly. And the idea of this machine is that it's going to be a hopper. So it's going to be able to, to just hop 20 kilometers with one small jump, do analysis, keep hopping across the planet. Uh, so because besides lakes and, and oceans, there is obviously ice. There is land, if you want. Again, organic uh, oil land, but uh, but it's, uh, it's solid, right? So uh, so it's frozen ice, uh, but uh, but it's going to be able to touch down and do things. So that's the Dragonfly mission. So uh, hopefully, so this is one of the two finalists for uh, for uh, for the next generation of missions from NASA. The other one is uh, is uh, the goal is to go to a comet, get a sample, and take it back to Earth. Uh, so, but uh, this is you know the one that is related to actually looking for life, uh, which is the things that I that I do. So, uh, so I only talk about this one. But uh, uh, so um, so way before this, uh, in our team and at, at SETI and also at NASA, uh, there was a project um, uh, that we went to this uh, this little lake here. It's still in the Andes, but if you go south a little bit, so Santiago, the Chile is somewhere here. Um, this is Buenos Aires here. So so this is right. It's not that quite as high as the Atacama. This is only like 11,000 feet, perhaps. Pretty high still. But there is a couple of lakes there that are glacier lakes. So they're fed only by glacier water. So it's super clean water, and as you can, as you can see here. So this is, uh, this is uh, pictures taken by a diver that went down to, I think it's 15 meters. Uh, that's like 30 feet, something like that. Um, and uh, probably 40 feet. Uh, and there's still so much light coming in. I don't know if some of you scuba dive or anything, but it's very rare to see clear water like this in a lake uh, 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 anymore, unless it's a glacier lake. So there is a glacier coming from here, and in the winter it feeds the lake with water. Uh, so, uh, so we like this place because uh, it's high enough in elevation that the radiation is pretty high still, which means that there is not much life. And although you can see some kind of lichen and, and little things here, that's very rare. This is only because it's super hot. It's usually pretty cold here as well. But again, life here is tough, right? So. But life for life to exist, especially down here, they have to develop specific pigments and like sunblock, if you want. So there's certain chemical molecules that you can put on your skin to protect from the sun. So the same thing is what the bacteria do here. Develop certain chemicals that cover and shield them so they're protected from the sun. So we're looking for these things. And this was called the Planetary Lake Lander Project and a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, teams from different places. And we had our camp set there. Uh, so, uh, and what we did is to have to develop a little, again, another float that looks like the one that NASA wanted to fly, but never flew. Uh, maybe we didn't do the job, right? But, uh, but, uh, but basically, the idea was using this, uh, this uh, lander here, Lake Lander, to, uh, to get information about the environment, uh, look for storms, look for uh, environmental indicators that something was happening. And the idea was to, to use this not only for NASA research, but also for environmental assessment. So some of you, or most of you probably have heard that a lot of glaciers are disappearing on Earth, global warming and all that. So a lot of glaciers are gone or going. And the idea is how does the, this glacier retreat affect the ecosystem locally? So in this case, this glacier is retreating. Retreat, ah, no, not yet, not yet, yet. Go back. Yeah, so, uh, so the lake is going down. And we want to understand how that affects ecology in the lake, uh, uh, as well as, of course, preparing for, for, for tenant exploration. But, uh, so for that reason, we not only developed this, but also some technologies to do the chemistry of the water and looking for life in the water and see how we can tie uh, water chemistry with life content. Uh, so we have several systems here. Uh, 
another lab here with more more stuff. And one of these instruments is this this little four guys here. This is just little fiber with a little uh, light coming in through. And as the fiber is immersed in the water, it's taking the chemistry in from the water and it's changing color. You can see here, but the, but the idea is that we can absorb some of the chemicals from the from the lake. Think about contamination of lakes and waters. So with this machine, we can take in small amounts of that and we can measure it. So we know actually how much, say, elements or chemicals are there in the water by just having this little thing uh, here. Uh, so uh, same with this other guy. And this is a laser. Uh, and what we're doing here is uh, we couple the laser with a, with a chemical probe to measure water properties. And the idea here was uh, to understand uh, how these properties, like the pH or salinity, uh, would connect with the amount of life that in the water. So, so again, this is a precursor of the things that we hopefully will fly to Titan or other oceans uh, out there uh, to be looking for life. Um, and by other places, I mean uh, moons like Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. And uh, so uh, this is a very interesting place. So the moon is super small. It's the size of the of Britain, basically. It's like, I don't know, like 600 miles long, kind of like a, a super small ball of ice, which was thought, thought that it was just ice, just chunk of ice. It really is not. Uh, it has a rocky core, like think about a rock, and then there is a layer of water, and then there is a layer of ice, right? So we don't know how thick the layer of ice is. It could be anywhere from 10 miles to 100, to 100 miles, perhaps. But we do know that uh, there is some cracks on the surface, and through them, there is water just jetting out. So we call these plumes. Think about, again, Yellowstone, like a geyser. So because Saturn is so heavy and massive, it's pulling from this water, it's creating tides. The same tides we have on Earth here, if you put a lid on it, eventually it's going to go. So uh, that is what happens here. When it's too warm and too much pressure coming in, the whole thing just boils. Uh, uh, so so uh, with, with Cassini, one of the missions from NASA, we've been able to kind of fly through, not too close, but close enough to capture some of this ice coming out and analyze some of the matter that is coming from there. And because of that analysis, we learned that there must be chimneys down here between this silica, rocky core and the ocean. There must be a connection. And that's hopefully and likely, likely a chimney, a hydrothermal vent. And then again, if you listened to me earlier, that's a very cool place, very special place for us because we think that that's what life started here on Earth. So uh, having evidence that these guys exist elsewhere makes suddenly Enceladus be a prime target for astrobiology, for looking for life uh, elsewhere. And so uh, for that reason, uh, this, so this is actually a real picture of Enceladus with the geysers coming out. Uh, so my team, uh, we're working on a concept of a mission that is going to be able to fly through uh, much closer, so be able to collect some of, that, some of the ice with a funnel and bring it down into, a, into the lab to be able to analyze the ice right there. Uh, so uh, so uh, the other main target, so by the way, we call this ocean worlds, because they have oceans. So, uh, so the other ocean prime ocean world is Europa, and this is a moon of Jupiter. Uh, so Europa is way bigger than, than Enceladus, but it has the same systems. So, uh, so we know that it has, a, again, a rocky core, ocean, global ocean around, and then ice cover on it. So uh, again, we don't know how thick it is, but we think that it could be down to one kilometer or like one mile at some places. So uh, only recently we have observed plumes as well here. So there is jets coming out from Europa. Uh, and you can see all this, this, this real pictures from Europa. So you see all the cracks here and all the, all the formations as well. So that makes us think that there is certain tectonic activity or ice tonic, I don't know how to call it, but, uh, but there is movement of ice and there is things moving around. So there is, the thing is active. And then again, it's because it's a massive planet are, uh, near it that is pulling so hard that it's heating up the ocean. So things are moving all the way. So some people think that there's even chunks of ice that flip over, like boom, like happens in Antarctica actually. So uh, it's a very interesting place. And, and NASA is working on a, on a concept of a lander to Europa. So this has never been done. The only places where we have landed is uh, Venus, and that's only been the Russians who've been able to do it, the Moon, obviously, and Mars. And of course, some asteroids, the Japanese, the Hayabusa mission was able to go to an asteroid and bring a sample back. The Europeans went to the, to the comet, the Rosetta mission. 
that landed on a comet and was able to analyze it uh, for a while. But there's not been any other landing in any moon or planet. So Europa Lander would likely be the next, uh, the next objective. And actually NASA is putting effort and Congress is supporting this, likely. So, uh, so uh, some of the teams that we want to fly um, stuff to Europa, want to analyze the ice in search for life, we're testing technology uh, to go there. And of course, when you think about Europa, you're talking about minus 150 degrees, probably more. Well, I, I get lost in those numbers with Fahrenheit and Celsius, but uh, it's, it's damn cold. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so for that, you're thinking about Antarctica, right? So this is the coldest place we know. And, and we, we're looking at places like look like Europa uh, in the sense of exploration. So our place is called Anthracene, which is basically is a lake uh, which is under a crust of ice, which is fed by a glacier. So, uh, so you have a system here that is analogous to Europa, in that you have uh, your lake, which is 400 feet deep, and you have a lid or a top layer of ice, which is about 15 feet, right? So it scales up pretty well to what Europa is. And, uh, and part, of the, part of the interesting thing about this lake is that this top layer of ice has been in place for about 20,000 years. So there hasn't been any interaction between the water and the microbes that live there in the atmosphere for as long as that time. Uh, that's the conservative estimate, but uh, these guys have been there on their own for 20,000 plus years, which means that these are some of the oldest creatures that we have uh, evidence of. And uh, so uh, we have divers as well that are experts in ice diving. So this is actually a real picture of the, of the bottom of the lake. Uh, of course, this is not this is not 400 feet because nobody can dive down there, but uh, this is like about 30 feet, 35 feet. And you have all these pinnacles here. And these pinnacles are special because at first sight, they look like they're just, okay, like a cone of rock, right? Like a little thing. No, it's actually organic matter. It's like a, think about algae or moss. It's all compacted and it's making this pyramid shape here. And these are the guys. Hmm? Like a coral. Kind of, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good analogy, actually. But the difference is that there is no life in corals is way more advanced than these guys are here. This is precursor to that. So this is way more simple, simple life. Uh, it's a, this is the mo some of the simplest organisms that we, that we know of. So they could develop into coral eventually, but uh, it's too cold here. So there's no, uh, no chance for them to, to make it. So yeah, the temperature here of the water is about freezing. So 36 degrees, 35. And so, and these are like, two feet high, some of them. So, so uh, these are very unique and very cool places to look for new life. Actually, new life has been discovered here, or new forms of life uh, on Earth. So we think that by studying this lake, uh, so the chemistry of the water, these pinnacles, and some of the dry lakes that are around it, like this one, where these guys eventually get exposed to the air, which is dry and cold, and they evolve and leave some rests of life or organic matter. So by doing this connection, we can actually learn about potential search for life on Europa and other places. And so we, we, we get cores from the ice, uh, analyze the ice and some of the rocks that happen there. Not just the rocks, but the interface between the rock and the ice, which is an interesting place for life uh, as well. So we have drones. Uh, and this is the camp, actually. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, so the scale, this is a skidoo, a uh, snowmobile. So that's the scale, like six feet. And we have a few tents and labs and stuff, and we just spend there a couple months, three months, every other year or so, and, and we move around with, uh, with vehicles. And yeah, and we, again, we bring the same tools that you've seen before, uh, and some others as well, uh, like uh, samplers and like, like drones as well. So, uh, so the idea again is to, to push the technology, not just for flyers or for water samplers, but also for, for the laser instruments that you saw before, and look for signals and look for evidence of life here, which is tough place for life as well. So, uh, so we get the drone and we get measurements about, about the ice, uh, we get data, we learn, we get cold, sometimes we have beer if we're lucky. So you know, it's a tough life, but it's a very, very rewarding in the sense that um, we're learning so much every time we go there about the extremes of life in the cold and dry, that it's giving us hopes that we could find things like this uh, elsewhere, especially on Mars. Uh, coincidentally, because again, Mars is dry and cold, as, as I said earlier. So this serves as a very cool place for both ocean worlds and, uh, and, uh, and Mars as well. 
And uh, so, uh, one of the latest projects that we, if, if anybody gets disturbed by the flashes, just let me know and I'll stop it. But uh, so, uh, so uh, the next step beyond sending divers into these lakes is going to be uh, the new project that we just got funded uh, a couple of months ago. It's called Invader, and the idea is to to eventually develop a small uh, AUV. This is an uh, autonomous underwater vehicle. So this is a robot, like the drones, but instead of flying, they just swim, right? So, so our drone is gonna have, uh, it's gonna have lasers. They're gonna be able to look into the chimneys. So here we're going full mission stuff. So we're assuming that we have vents on Enceladus. We're assuming we're eventually gonna fly there, break through the ice somehow, and deploy a, a mission, like a submarine mission, to be able to find, to find the vents analyze them with all kinds of lasers and lidars and imagers, pictures, whatnot, get samples. And these are some of the some of the experiments that we're already doing underwater. So underwater laser stuff analysis is kind of like a new thing. So there's still a lot of things to learn. So it's gonna take a while to develop this. But uh, so we luckily we got four years of funding for this. So, so hopefully we'll get something done. But, um, but that's the kind of thing that we're pushing to in terms of flying to other ocean worlds for for mission and and this is the last slide and I'm gonna leave it here plenty of time for for questions and so uh, I like this that this is like a, like an ESA European Space Agency uh, drawing and it really shows what what this is all about and uh, we live on Earth is the only planet that we know there is life uh, and there will be for a while it's the only planet we know we can live on and we don't know if there's any other life elsewhere there has to be because of the numbers but we haven't found it. Uh, but to get there, we have to start working, and we already have, in technology to do that. And satellites, rovers, eventually sample return missions to go to Mars and bring samples back, and eventually sending humans over there. And I was speaking with somebody earlier about the whole human uh, aspect of, uh, of exploration, which I didn't touch here, because I work mostly with robots. But uh, at the very end, uh, you know, we've done it for as long as we've been humans, we like to colonize, we like to expand, we like to go beyond, to go farther away, explore new things, new places. So space is out there, it's huge. We'll never cover all it, or uh, all of it, but, uh, but our solar system, Mars, the moon, the moons of Mars, the moons of Jupiter, Saturn, they're places that we're slowly getting uh, smart about them in the sense of being able to fly there, know what they're made of, and very soon uh, we'll be able to start thinking about how do we put humans there. Uh, first, as a curiosity, as, hey, let's just put a flag here, just because we can, and then start using that for resources. You know, uh, mining asteroids, comets, the moon, for fuel, for water, for uh, resources, minerals. Uh, uh, it's something that is gonna happen, and it's happening already. So uh, it's only thanks to uh, all the work of not just the US, but all the agencies around the world that are pushing for that, that will eventually be able to put humans uh, on Mars, like you saw in the movie, The Martian. So that's, it's getting closer by the day. Okay, with every mission we send to Mars, we test a new technology for, for, for getting there. So for example, in the, in, the, in the NASA Mars 2020 mission, there's gonna be a small instrument that is gonna be able to suck up CO2 from the atmosphere and break it down into oxygen and other products. And the oxygen is something that we can use for breathing, obviously. So, so you know, starting to use resources in other planets and other places is something that is gonna put us closer to our goal of eventually just going away and, and expanding uh, beyond our planet. So with that, I'll leave it here and I'll take all the questions that you have. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Some water.